Okay. See, what do you say we go ahead and... Good morning, everyone. I'm Doug Conrad, Executive Director of the U.S. Association for Energy Economics, and I'm very grateful to welcome all of you today uh, to our webinar, Oil Trade, Can the United States Remain a Net Exporter? This webinar is being co-hosted by USAEE and the Center for Energy Studies at the Baker Institute for Public Policy. I'd like to also welcome Mark Finley uh, from the Center for Energy Studies, uh, who will be moderating today's event. USAEE provides a forum for the exchange of experiences, ideas, and issues for professionals interested in energy economics. The organization produces professional journals, a newsletter, and holds conferences and virtual presentations and a host of other products and services that you can find at our website, usaee.org. The webinar today is being recorded for those who could not participate in the live event. If you have questions, please click the Q&A button at the bottom of your window. And now I'd like to introduce you to our moderator, Mark Finley of Rice University's Baker Institute for Public Policy. Thanks, Doug. And let me add my thanks to everyone joining us today for what I'm sure will be a fun and informative conversation. And let me emphasize the conversation part of that. Oil dependence has been seen as a strategic risk for the United States since at least the oil embargo of 1973. Indeed, beginning with Richard Nixon, every US president has made self-sufficiency or independence a policy objective. For the first 30 years, however, it didn't do much good Imports and import dependence as a share of consumption both continued to increase. By 2005, U.S. net oil imports surpassed 60% of domestic oil consumption. In that year, net imports of crude oil and refined products exceeded 12 and a half million barrels per day, more than all of Europe, and nearly double that of Japan and China combined. But then George Mitchell got to work. Shale technologies first applied to natural gas quickly moved over to the oil bearing formations. As domestic oil production boomed and domestic demand largely stagnated, while de emerging market demand continued to grow, new markets were opened up for US production. And as you know, shale production has dramatically impacted global energy markets uh, and OPEC strategy. The United States became a net exporter of natural gas on an annual basis in 2017. Our country became a total energy net exporter in 2019 for the first time since 1952. And while full year data isn't available yet, it's likely that on an annual basis, the US became a net oil exporter last year for the first time since the 1940s. Moreover, US refiners have also benefited from the rapid growth in domestic production and transport bottlenecks, moving the United States from being a significant net importer of refined products to being one of the world's largest net exporters. It's important to note, however, that even as the US has become a net oil exporter, it remains a large importer of both crude oil and refined products with substantial variations by crude quality, refined product type, and region of the country. This switch to being a net oil exporter has had profound implications for US strategic thinking. And just a few examples to get us started. Energy independence became energy dominance in the last administration, and then President Trump intervened last year to help end the Saudi-Russian price war to support domestic prices and domestic producers. On a policy front, new measures in recent years have been adopted to boost exports of both crude oil, refined products, and natural gas, with the latter partly rationalized as climate policy. On the trade front, uh, the US shale revolution has had significant implications for trade policy and the value of the dollar. Energy, after all, was half of America's trade deficit in 2005. 
It has certainly provided the United States with dramatically greater geopolitical leverage and not only vis-a-vis -vis Middle East countries. And finally, this shift to being a net oil exporter has clearly influenced US sanctions policy as well as military posture. But can we count on the United States remaining a net oil exporter? And will it matter? How will the COVID pandemic and other factors impact future US oil exports? Again, a few factors to consider. Even last year, while the US became a net oil exporter on an annual basis, there were a couple of months when the US moved back into being a net importer as domestic production collapsed. And going forward, domestic producers are under tremendous pressure from investors due not only to lower prices, but to growing ESG and energy transition concerns. We saw last year several domestic refinery closures announced, while new refineries in Asia and the Middle East potentially threaten US refined product export markets. Here in Washington, DC, the new Biden administration portends a very different policy and regulatory environment. And the transition to a lower carbon energy future seems to be gathering steam here in the US and around the world. Now today we have two great speakers to help us make sense of the prospects for and drivers of US oil exports, as well as the broader implications for markets, domestic politics, and geopolitics. Clay Siegel, who is the early bird today, getting up the earliest, uh, is Managing Director at Vortexa in Houston. Michael Cohen is Chief Economist, Chief U.S. Economist and Head of Oil Analysis at BP. I will ask each speaker to start with a sentence or two on themselves and their company. In their introductory remarks, Clay will kick off with short-term observations and Michael will take a longer term perspective. We'll then move to a moderated discussion and audience Q&A. And as Doug mentioned at the beginning, you can send us your questions using the Q&A function. So with that, Clay, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Clay Siegel, and I've been working in the field of oil market intelligence for 20, 23 years now. You know, I'm actually, I'm turning 50 next month. I think this is the time when we start to round down on these uh, milestones. So let's just say 20. But um, I'm responsible for Vortex's business in the Americas. Uh, Vortex is an energy intelligence company focused on the seaborne trade of oil and gas. Uh, our technology brings together data from many different sources, satellites, terrestrial sensors, uh, human uh, data and feeds it all into an AI engine to provide the gold standard for real-time cargo tracking and forecasting. Uh, our clients at Vortexa are primarily oil and gas traders, both physical and financial, who of course are looking to buy low and sell high, and they can do that more effectively when they have uh, reliable proprietary leading indicators on what we're going to talk about today, volumes of uh, imports and exports, uh, volumes of oil on the water, in transit, in floating storage. Uh, Vortex is headquartered in London, and we have offices in uh, Houston and Singapore. And this is my first presentation at an event hosted by USAEE. So I'd like to, I'd like to thank uh, Doug Conrad and the organizers for inviting me to participate. And thanks as well to the uh, Baker Institute's Center for Energy Studies for co-sponsoring the event. So as Mark mentioned, the, the United States first became on a monthly basis a net oil exporter back in October of 2019. And yes, in our data, we did observe uh, uh, sort of a noteworthy regression to net importer status last spring and summer. But that turned out to be a blip and we've been back to net exporter uh, ever since. But that's such a broad brush kind of headline figure. What's really fascinating about the oil net export analysis is the individual storylines of the components of this aggregate trade flow. And these are the storylines that um, come to life when we look at our data through the lenses of um, our distinct regional geographies in the United States, the various oil products across the barrel and the, the economics of local production and consumption. 
So to set the stage for our discussion today, let me just take a few minutes to outline and quantify some of the, the structural realities of oil supply and demand in the United States. Now, the biggest single element of the US oil trade balance, of course, is crude oil. And these days we produce 11 million barrels per day domestically. We import another six plus million barrels a day from foreign suppliers. Now we're only consuming about 14 million barrels today at uh, today's refinery run rates. And we export about 3 million barrels per day. So in the big picture, you could say that crude oil in the United States is balanced around 17 million barrels a day in and out of the system. Now, I don't know if all of you have had your first cup of coffee yet. I mean, the first glaring question that comes to mind is why are we at the same time importing and exporting big volumes of any one commodity? And the answer, of course, is that crude is far from a single homogeneous commodity. And that makes all the difference in the world. Crude is really bifurcated into two main buckets, heavy and light. And in the United States, we're structurally short, heavy and long light crude. So that's why we need to import enough heavy to supply our complex refinery systems in the Gulf Coast. We'll talk about that. And it's also why uh, the United States was able to become a supplier to the international market for crude uh, since the export ban was lifted in 2015. Uh, regional distinctions are also really important for the crude balance story. So our refineries on the Atlantic coast tend to be simpler in nature, meaning they largely just need light crude. And so they're part of this transatlantic light crude trade with supplies coming from uh, Northwest Europe, used to be a lot coming from West Africa before domestic production pushed some of that out. And so that Atlantic market has exposure to Brent light oil prices. Gulf Coast refineries are just very different by nature they have some of the highest complexity ratings in the world, which is just a fancy way of saying they were designed to, in a way, work harder to process heavier oil that's largely sourced from Mexico and other Latin American suppliers. Now, Gulf Coast refiners can only process a limited amount of light oil, which is the kind that we specialize in producing uh, domestically. So one of the first economic realities to understand is that our independence when it comes to light oil does not give us independence on crude oil overall. Now at Vortexa, we expect the status quo for uh, crude trade to really continue. The US is gonna be importing more heavy crude than exporting light. However, the volume of light crude exports could definitely increase if we have both a rebound in US production and also an expansion of export capacity. Remember the biggest uh, bottleneck in our ability to export oil is actually that final mile at the docks at the coastal terminals. And our ability to load uh, super tankers is still, is still limited, although we're making progress there. I'll just say a word quickly also about uh, refined petroleum products because this is an important part of the, the net balance. Uh, in the United States, we're long clean products. We export about 2 million barrels a day and we're short dirty petroleum products. We import about a half million barrels a day. But when it comes to these refined products, it's the regional variations in production and consumption patterns that really kind of tell the tale rather than quality. And it's a tale of uh, two coasts, if you will. So again, the Atlantic coast is net short refined products. It relies on imports from across the Atlantic. The Gulf Coast is net long refined products and it is actually a major supplier to consuming markets around the world. Uh, on the product level, the main product imported on the East Coast is gasoline. We watch that number very carefully at Vortexa. Uh, the top line number will ebb and flow with things like um, uh, changing seasonal fuel specs and, and kind of product demand. But uh, the ballpark of the East Coast has always imported about a half million barrels a day, more refined products than it exports. And um, well, when it comes to those, those exports from the East Coast, it's, that's mostly propane from Pennsylvania. It's not uh, transportation fuel per se. And down here in my neck of the woods, uh, the Gulf Coast is a major net exporter of refined products. We consistently export more than 2 million barrels a day of, of product than we import. 
And the, the product slate down here in the Gulf Coast is those transportation fuels. It's gasoline, it's diesel, and in addition, those liquefied petroleum gases, propane and, and butane. Now, again, at first glance, you'd think it's mutually exclusive for the United States to be simultaneously long and short these products across geographies. But you have to remember a second big reality of uh, US oil economics, and that is there are impediments to certain oil movements, uh, both um, regulatory in nature and also uh, related to our infrastructure that limit the ability of products to flow freely between regions with price differentials. Uh, the biggest example is uh, the Jones Act, which prohibits all but uh, a really a specialized fleet of tankers from transporting oil from one domestic port to another. Uh, there are other uh, impediments when it comes to uh, logistical bottlenecks over land, like for pipeline capacity, but both of these prevent the surplus on the Gulf Coast from fully accommodating the deficit on the East Coast. And so this, um, this tale of two coasts and the imperfect linkages between them is, uh, is likely here to stay. So, you know, with these regional storylines uh, and a couple of oil economy realities, right? Light crude independence isn't full crude independence. Um, arbitrage between regions can't be fully exploited in the United States. I think we now have a solid foundation to guide our discussion. And so uh, while a lot of our data of Vortexa is focused on sort of the immediate, very short term, um, I'm looking forward to hearing Michael describe some of the, the scenarios for the longer term future that will influence this net export story. So let me stop there. Thanks, Clay. <clears throat> um, my name is Michael Cohen and I lead our oil and refining al analysis at, at BP. Um, and I'm also chief US economist. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to be joining all of you today. Um, and I want to thank the Baker Institute and also the USAE for, for hosting this important conversation and for Mark for, for gathering a, a group of, of really uh, great people to, to have a well-rounded uh, discussion around this topic. Um, I want to uh, warn all of you in advance, I had a little bit of a, an internet issue about five minutes ago. So if uh, I break up, um, apologies in advance, I will probably turn off video and then just show uh, show my screen along with the, the presentation that I had prepared. Um, so to, to just start off, um, just bear with me for one second. Um, here we go. So I wanted to, to sort of frame my remarks around three different angles around the long term and the, the implications. First, just talking about the economic implications of, of being a, a net exporter. Um, and second, uh, talk about the production angle that I think is going to obviously play a big role um, in the, the status of the US as a net uh, oil exporter, net energy exporter. And then finally, just address the, the issues related to demand um, that I think are going to become a bigger and bigger issue as we move into the next decade. So um, I think it's important to first state that, that the changes that we've seen in the energy sector have, have changed more than just the oil markets and, and the natural gas markets. There have also been important implications for trade, investment, industrial production, um, and employment. And uh, before starting at BP, uh, about two years ago, I was a um, I was on on a research I was a researcher at, at Barclays, and some of the work that we did with some of our colleagues um, showed that the increase in U.S. energy production and the narrowing of the petroleum trade balance helped lift. Uh, U.S. economic growth by about 20 to 25 basis points per year over the past decade, mainly through increased exports and investment. Um, and those estimates are consistent with, with other literature, for example, and, and other studies that were done by the Dallas Fed, for example, the, excuse me, and, and the IMF and, and, uh, and other uh, universities. Um, now, business investment spending has also been another beneficiary of this energy revolution and investment uh, related to the energy sector increased fourfold with that growth rate averaging about 20% per year. 
So as a result, um, energy-related investment as a share of GDP um, increased to about 1.3% in 2014, which is six times higher than it was in 2000. Um, and although it's most recently settled back in a range of about 1%, that share of energy-related investment remains well above the historical average. Now, it's important to also understand that that relative share of oil and gas extraction in industrial production has also risen, and it's been up to about 13%, probably slightly lower than that at this point. Um, but this has also boosted aggregate GDP and employment uh, through both direct and indirect effects. Um, so the, the other thing in terms of, of productivity that's been important is that um, it has improved the productivity of the economy as a whole um, because of the very significant gains that we've seen in productivity in the oil and gas uh, extraction sector. Um, and so this has an influence as well on the dollar oil relationship. And so that means that the relationship between the dollar and the, and the price of oil uh, tends to be far more negative when that trade surplus is negative. Um, and then when it's been balanced or when it's exporting and that relationship tends to fall apart. So for much of the 1990s and then from 2005 to 2013, the dollar's relationship to oil has been mostly negative, implying that the higher oil prices corresponded with a lower, US, lower value of the US dollar. Uh, but over the last five years or so, in advance of COVID, those relationships seem to have become weaker. And now, as we're all experiencing uh, during, during the, the pandemic that we're living through, that relationship has become quite negative again, and largely as a result of the, of the decline in the net uh, trade balance as shown in, in this chart here. So, the productivity gains and the improvement in terms of trade has increased the value of the dollar also by about three to four um, percent. And sorry, I just wanted to interrupt for a second. You're, you're, um, if you were attending to show slides, we're not picking them up here. Uh, okay. Thanks. Sorry about that. Um, there we go. Is that working now? Yes. Okay. Apologies. So basically what I'm showing here, um, and again, apologies, is just the net petroleum trade balance. So demand um, and, and supply, and then the net of that is the, is the Blue Hill. And there's obviously some, um, there's some components of the supply side that are missing here. Otherwise, you'd see them, them overlapping as we get into the 2020 timeframe. But the, the important thing to understand is that the petroleum trade balance um, is now only a very small share of the overall goods balance. Um, and of course, the, the rapid increase in supply that Mark and Clay both talked about has been the primary contributor to the decline in net petroleum imports. So um, the, the second thing I wanted to talk about is just the, the continuous, the outlook for continuous growth, at least through 2030 for US tight oil supply. And what I'm talking about there is both the, the, the growth in crude and condensate and for NGLs. Um, and so with the expectation that going forward, we could be in a scenario where the, 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 the the decline in need for transport-related fuels results in a reduction in the need for refining throughput and refining capacity. It means that there are going to be certain geographies, the U.S. being possibly one of them, where there is a, a possibility that some of that that the refining capacity will not be needed in the future. Um, and so our analysis over the long term shows that there's certain capacity that is less resilient than other places, and those places lack cheap inland feedstock, or the analysis shows that that the closures are most likely where product demand is stagnant or falling and is most resilient where product demand is, is increasing, namely in Asia um, and in the Middle East. So what does this all mean for, for the US? Um, over the, over the, the longer term, what these charts are showing both for oil and for natural gas in the rapid scenario, which is one where, where oil demand is falling uh, to about the, the sort of mid 70 to, to 80 million barrel a day range, um, where you have a, uh, a carbon budget that needs to be met. 
versus a business as usual scenario where oil demand is is basically plateauing um, and so rebounding after COVID, but then plateauing um, in the 2030 timeframe. This is the kind of net uh, oil balance and net petroleum balance that the U.S. might experience in those scenarios. And so the, the complexity and level of sophistication in the U.S. refining system is driven more by market forces that require the conversion of anywhere between 30 to 60 percent of the crude oil barrel. And, and as Clay alluded to, that heavy portion um, is, is a key part of that. And it's taking products that have very little demand in the United States, like fuel oil, resid, asphalt, and, and turning that, uh, that, those heavier parts of the barrel into higher demand finished transport fuels. And so if the outlook for transportation fuels in a scenario like rapid is challenged, um, then that means that as long as U.S. supply stays resilient, the ability of the U.S. to maintain a positive net petroleum trade balance from 2030 onward is tied more to the decline in oil demand um, being a, a tailwind rather than to the strength of supply in the 2030 uh, timeframe and beyond. And so this means that there are a couple implications that I wanted to, to discuss and, and sort of pose as topics for discussion. One is that if we are in this world where, where the supply composition of, of the US is continuing to grow but is likely plateauing in the 2030 timeframe, um, and the growth of that U.S. supply tends to be more Gulf Coast centric, i.e. from the Permian, um, then it means that inland basins may be more challenged based on economics and, and midstream policy. And that has implications for refining margins inland. And it could support uh, Gulf Coast margins compared to inland margins, oh, again, over the longer term. The other thing that, that is worth uh, commenting on and thinking about is that if we are in this world where the where transport fuels in in um, in Europe and in the United States are are in a declining phase in that scenario, um, it means that petroleum uh, or sorry petrochemical demand of course could still be increasing at that time. So if nine to 9.3 million barrels a day of the 10 million barrels a day that, that the US uh, refining system is supplying of gasoline is used domestically, it means that more and more of those exports are going to need to find a home as, uh, elsewhere. So the gasoline could be increasingly directed into Latin America, increasingly uh, not necessarily into Europe. You already are, Europe already has a surplus of gasoline and could be therefore forced to send further afield or continue to rationalize the, the refining system. Um, the, the light ends, so LPG and, and naphtha due to petrochemical capacity growth, um, this may also uh, last, but how sustainable um, that is, is, is an open question as well, uh, especially as we go out into the 2030 and 2040 timeframe. The third thing is, is that the global crude supply mix is also likely to change over the long term. So we did some work looking at the implications of a, of a carbon price on crude quality. It means that the opportunity for U.S. crude exports into Europe and Asia may actually increase because of the low carbon intensity of those crudes. And investment in deep water offshore, uh, such as in West Africa, might decline as the, the decline as the, the decline increases for uh, transport fuels. I think the other thing to, to keep in mind here is that it may also have investment implications. Um, one that I, I would want to highlight is that in a world that is rapidly decarbonizing, the investment rationale that has existed in the past for new crude export infrastructure on the Gulf Coast um, may in the future have to become increasingly about the decline in product demand um, and the need to therefore think about finding homes for that for that reduction in transport fuels and the, the increase in, in transport fuel demand in, in other places on a relative basis. And it be, so therefore it's becoming more about the decline in product demand in the United States and less about surplus crude that needs to find a home somewhere else. So 
key conclusions from from my perspective that that I wanted to talk about. Number one, that 20 to 25 basis point contribution of uh, the, of the U.S. energy system to U.S. GDP growth is not insignificant, and it's something that policymakers are going to have to to understand. Um, the second is that the terms of trade plays an important role in the dollar oil correlation and a negative correlation is going to return already has returned if that term of trade uh, worsens and will be a key thing for for policymakers to keep in mind as well. Um, the third thing is just the, to restate the composition of tight oil growth is likely to change in the next decade. It means it's going to be more Permian centric, uh, not as diverse necessarily as it has been over the last five to seven years. And that is therefore going to favor Gulf Coast refiners over inland ones if that, that does happen. Um, and so I think that policymakers should be seeing these terms of trade benefits over the longer term, increasingly from the demand lens rather than from the supply lens, as we, especially as we get out into 2030, and especially if we are in a world that is, is uh, needing to rapidly decarbonize. So I'll stop there and I look forward to our discussion. Great. Thanks to uh, you know both of you, you know, for 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 the interesting conversation and uh, you know for teeing us up. Um, before we move on, I just want to remind our audience that uh, if you know if you want to post questions, uh, please do so using the Q and A function uh, you know, at the bottom of your tab. Um, to to kick us off, um, I wanted to follow up and get both of your uh, perspectives on. Um, something that, that Michael said in his wrap up. Um, I mean, I was struck, Michael, by your observation that, um, you know, in scenarios where US domestic demand falls, um, that more of the action uh, from an infrastructure and from a trade basis would move into refined product exports. Um, but um, I guess my question is, how, how do you square that and think through the economics of that in a world where um, you know new refining capacity is being built, as 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 I think both of you noted, in places where uh, you know demand is growing, or or maybe in the more aggressive scenarios, less likely to, likely to fall less rapidly. So if they've got their own refineries, you know, in Asia and in the Middle East, how can U.S. refiners be positioned to compete in a global marketplace in the face of falling domestic demand? Well, I can go first if you want. Um, there's also the issue of uh, recently falling demand in those international consuming markets. And so the first big kind of X factor that's going to answer your question is the pace of, of oil demand recovery by region. And so we have seen in the short term data at Vortexa a little bit of a rebound in one of the most important consuming markets for United States product exports, which is Latin America. And so those were, were languishing quite a bit. Uh, over the last kind of six to nine months, but did, did pop a little bit recently. We don't know if it's a blip or something that US uh, product exporters can really take comfort in. But I think you hit the nail on the head when you talk about the, the uh, relative strengths and weaknesses of the refining complexes uh, across regions. And so what we see in some of the non-OECD countries, uh, particularly China and India, is uh, new refining capacity coming on stream. So even though that's not really happening materially over here and hasn't in a long time, they are building new refineries and new refinery units. We're expecting at least a half a million barrels a day of new refining capacity to come online uh, just in China with some of these announced projects. And so there'll be consumers of crude, which, you know, and this all has feedback loops to our conversation, could, could be crude coming from Texas and Louisiana, which is a really important part of the, of the oil trade right now. But focusing on the product market, that's it. So these new, um, more efficient uh, units for uh, refineries that are coming online in these countries are going to have a competitive advantage, not only against older refinery units in the United States, but even in their own regions, like in Asia Pacific, some of the units uh, in places like Australia, um, New Zealand, Philippines are having a hard time competing against those, um, those more efficient units in places like China. So that's another thing for the, the US exporters of refined products to consider. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would just put a, a broad frame on this, on the question, the important question that you asked, Mark, which is that the U.S. refining system has had to adjust to a differing crude slate over the last decade. And just as well over the next decade, we have a very, you know, in all scenarios, um, transportation demand in industrialized countries um, yes, we may experience a rebound, but after that, it, it tends to plateau in all of our scenarios, and we're not alone in, in forecasting that. So just as much as the crude slate, the, in, the, the uh, intake has changed just as well over the next decade, the, the requirement for what comes out of, refi of the refining system is going to change as well and become more petrochemical focused. Um, and more focused on on trying to to do something with the light ends that uh, that that the world is producing, um, and translating those those light that lighter end of the barrel into into what is uh, actually needed by by the by by consumers. Um, and so what that means is that Gulf Coast refiners will have to adjust again um, to that to that landscape. And in a world where um, you know, there the marginal hydrocarbon has has tended to be exported. Maybe in the future, it, it will not necessarily have to be exported, and those those light tight oil barrels may um, may find a home back in in the United States rather than being exported as as much. So I think that the the competitiveness of of, uh, of the Gulf Coast refining system is going to continue to be a uh, challenge in a world where transport fuels are are plateauing or declining. Um, and so therefore, as, as Clay said, they're going to need to adjust to that new reality and the, the Asian refiners that are coming on um, and Middle Eastern refiners that are coming on are, are going to challenge that incrementally over the next five years. Mm. You, you, um, um, uh, you also mentioned, uh, Michael, about the uh, the economic benefits of being a net exporter. Um, and, uh, you know, if, 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 uh, if you agree, uh, Clay, uh, I'd be interested in both of your thoughts about, well, if, if this is good for uh, the U.S. economy and for U.S. Uh, interests more broadly, what could or should policymakers do Especially given that much of our audience, uh, you know, in, in the USA, uh, you know, has, has government backgrounds. You know, what, what can what can or should policymakers be doing uh, to make sure that uh, the U.S. remains competitive in the global uh, marketplace? Well, I guess speaking from here in in Texas in the patch, um, you know, suggestion number one would be. Um, please get out of the way. <laughs> and so what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the fewer, the fewer barriers and impediments to, to free trade, you know, generally, uh, the more these companies uh, based domestically are, are going to be able to thrive and implement their plans with uh, international buyers. Um, we can take a specific example because a minute ago I started to talk about uh, this really important trade in crude oil that's taken root just in 2020, which is from the U.S. Gulf Coast to China. And it turns out that in recent months, notwithstanding all the craziness that happened in the oil market last year, um, apparently Chinese refiners developed quite the appetite for United States uh, crude grades, not just you know, your classic West Texas Intermediate and West Texas Midland, but Eagleford, Bakken, and, uh, and some of the smaller grades as well. So you know, let's introduce the policy uh, dimension here. So the Outgoing administration's relationship with uh, China and trade policy could be described as um, inimical uh, in some respects. And so I think on our side, we're expecting the incoming Biden administration to also be pretty tough and demanding <clears throat> with its Chinese interlocutors on trade, but probably with a little bit less of a, uh, of a hostile angle and a little bit less of a, maybe a zero sum game when, when thinking about trade policy. So there was an interim trade deal that, uh, that came about um, last year and the, uh, the Chinese had certain requirements to purchase all kinds of uh, US manufactured goods, including energy, but they only wound up um, bringing in a, a fraction of what was called for during that interim treaty. So one of the, one of the biggest um, considerations that I'm looking at into the new administration is the extent to which um, U.S. oil producers and exporters are able to access international markets like China compared to before. Does it become easier or harder? That's that's one really important thing to look for as as the new group gets underway. 
So I think from my end, um, I guess I have, uh, there, there are obviously the trade angle and trade policy angle that, that is going to be important, um, as Clay said. I think I, I'm concerned about two other things. Number one, which is that policymakers need to fully understand the implications of actions that they take um, and, and understand the contribution that the U.S. energy system um, makes to the U.S. economy through cycles. Um, and I think that, that an updated assessment of that would be welcome um, because I know that our work um, in when I wore other hats and, and our work at, at um, you know, and with my current role and responsibilities in researching this topic and understanding this topic, there's, there, it could really use an update. Um, so that, that's one thing. Um, and I think it's important to go back to the, the points that I highlighted in terms of the, the contribution that it makes to shield uh, the consumer, the contribution that US, the U.S. energy system makes to shield the U.S. consumer during uh, down cycles, especially during the global financial crisis and even the cycle that we're living through right now. Um, so putting it, uh, erecting barriers to, to the production and export process needs to be understood uh, from that perspective as well. Number two, I think that um, what, what the Biden administration has already started to, to do in, in part or at least signal that it, it is planning to do is ensure that the industry uh, maintains good stewardship over the resource, over the development, exploration development and, and marketing of its, of its products. Um, because if we don't do that, um, then it, it's going to be very hard to reaffirm the need to continue to, to, to be producing these hydrocarbons for the purpose of, of American consumers. Um, so, th so we need to continue to work on that. Um, and, and obviously, there, there's debate about whether that needs to be at a local, state, uh, federal level. Um, but either way, uh, the stewardship uh, by the industry of, of the, the production of these resources needs to, needs to improve. I think that that's, a, I was struck, Michael, by your observation that in a, uh, a, a carbon priced environment, you know, the actual quality of the products of the U.S. Uh, like crude oil uh, would make it more competitive, you know, while on the other hand, you know, the issues around the, the gas flaring and the fugitive methane emissions, um, you know, for example, on the natural gas front recently led uh, the French government to uh, deny a permit to import LNG uh, from the United States into uh, into France because specifically because of the broader uh, environmental profile uh, and the emissions profile associated with the production. Right, right. I mean, I think that the trend is 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 improving, um, and we've seen it both within our our remit and our production, and as well within for other companies that the trend line is improving. Um, but it needs to improve even more uh, going forward. Um, so I was, my point was more over, over the long-term perspective. Um, Middle Eastern crudes tend to have a very low carbon intensity, um, but, but uh, in places where there's a lot of associated gas flaring as a percentage of the hydrocarbon, uh, as a percentage of hydrocarbon produced, um, the U.S. is still not in, a, not in a great place, relatively speaking, but that will improve. Right. And did I understand you also to be, be suggesting that, that, that the heavier crudes, for example, produced in the Middle East may not have a product slate, however, that is competitive in a, uh, you know, a, a more restrictive climate atmosphere? Well, I think that there, there are, num obviously, as, uh, as Clay mentioned, you know, all crudes are all crudes are different, Middle East ones as well. So, um, yeah, but yes, you know, the, the crudes that are higher, um, sorry, lower in API and higher in sulfur um, that have a very high middle distillate cut um, and are used for, for diesel, um, for asphalt, fuel oil, resid, you know, the bottom of, bottom of the barrel kind of products, um, you know, the, the outlook for those products is not growing. And so that means that those um, that that the crude slate from the Middle East is likely to have to to skew lighter and lighter as as well um, over time. Hey, Mark, I'll I'll react and just throw out one one related issue. You know, you're talking about the policy dimension and what's needed or not needed from policymakers, and then also um, kind of the um, the wellhead to burner tip. Um, 
life cycle view of uh, emissions. And so, um, I mean, we've got to throw into the conversation Keystone XL. Um, I actually wasn't expecting that in, in week one. Um, and the benefits of, of pipeline versus overland, I think, I think the audience is familiar with in terms of um, transportation safety. But this really just echoes the, the emphasis that's going to be on the, the full cycle infrastructure's contribution to, to um, emissions and to the, uh, you know, the targets, achieving the targets as, as really a, a new focus on this priority, again, from week one of the new administration. Yeah. No, and clearly the, uh, uh, when you think about the U.S. picture, uh, Canada looms very large in the trade dimension, both in terms of, um, you know, the production and export of heavy crude, uh, but also the fact that a lot of this is bottleneck that, that uh, winds up being priced very competitively to the benefit of the domestic U.S. refiners that take it. Yes, and I don't know if the audience is as familiar with the trade flows, but I, I referenced in my opening remarks that we import about six to seven million barrels a day of oil. Classically, you think about the waterborne stuff, stuff coming from the Middle East and Latin America, almost half of it is, is from Canada. You know, they're, they're the number one supplier uh, to the United States of crude. And that's the stuff that's coming by pipeline across the mid-continent to U.S. refiners. So, and some of it all the way down here to the Gulf Coast, by the way. So this is how the projects like Keystone play into the balance and play into um, the economics of the refiners, uh, which you alluded to in the beginning, the relative economics of uh, the Gulf Coast complex versus mid-continent. And to have um, big supply um, either bottled up or just more accessible to you know, pad two to the mid-continent uh, versus being able to make its way and get de-bottleneck down to the complex refineries down here that can really process it. Are, is going to have implications for relative refinery margins and, and profitability. Right. Do you, Clay, how is Vortex uh, uh, seeing, um, you know, the relative uh, markets for U.S. exports this year in terms of, you know, crude versus gasoline, diesel, and light end products like propane, which you mentioned, I think, in your introductory remarks? Right. The way I would characterize it is, um, steady as she goes. I mean, we're not seeing any signs of um, really an increase back to pre-pandemic levels in the main consuming markets for, for U.S. exports, nor, nor are we seeing a kind of an entrenched downturn. So I think that, again, the biggest X factor, and I'm sure that people attending these uh, seminars get tired of hearing it, but it's the, it's the relative pace of transportation fuel recovery, in, particularly in, the, in Europe, uh, which is lagging the rest of the world because of the, the recent and more severe and long lasting uh, lockdowns that are taking place for pandemic control. That's the number one uh, thing that we're looking at in terms of these trade flows to figure out if demand for US exports will still be there. But keep your eye on this, again, this crude flow from the United States to China. Uh, it fell off a little bit over the last few weeks after holding in remarkably well during 2020 Again, with everything going on, we exported about 3 million barrels per day from the United States to the various markets. And China is an important component of that. And uh, it has the ability to grow further as those new refining units come on stream there. So it's another thing that we're watching really carefully. Um, the, uh, thank you. I'm uh, reminding uh, our, uh, our audience uh, that you know, the, if there is a, a Q&A function if you want to pass things in. Amy Jaffe has passed a, a question into the panel. Thank you, Amy. Um, and and uh, you know, the question is, you know, does the panel believe that Keystone will still be needed in 5, 10, or 20 years you know, versus needing it you know, now? So one thing just to, again, to try to to re reframe the question would be to, to think about it in terms of the advantage that refiners in the mid-continent and in the Gulf Coast enjoy because of the access to cheap inland, cheaper inland feedstock. Um, and so the question isn't whether we need it or not. The question is whether it is enough to significantly challenge or raise the hurdle for those refineries to survive in a future that is lacking in incremental transport fuels growth. So I think it's it's hard, and maybe Clay, maybe you agree, or, but it will, if it's not a question of whether we need it or not, it's a question of whether we wanna handicap those refiners incrementally without that, that feed, 
that feedstock being available. Yes, and then I'm thinking about too the feedback loops that we talked about a few minutes ago in terms of some of the newer, more efficient international refineries being competitively advantaged against some of the older United States units and units in other countries as well. Uh, they're in some cases having a hard time staying open. So um, that's right, it starts with the outlook for demand for transportation. And then from there, we figure out how much uh, refined products, fuels are required to be manufactured. And then the mix of the feedstocks that should be uh, supplying it rather than rather than starting the other way around. Yeah, but I, I think it's it's interesting to think about you know the the debates and the conversations that policymakers had over the last 10 years about the the re, the profitability around east coast refiners and there was an energy security element to that um you know you had senators um congressmen arguing about the energy security implications of these refiners closing there were hearings that were held so you know fast forward 10 or 20 years we could be having similar conversations about the um, you know the the ability of Canadian of that Canadian resource to continue to support mid coast mid, mid continent and and Gulf Coast refiners and if it's not um, then how much does that um, handicap U.S. energy security? Um, you could definitely see that conversation happening. I'm just it's very hard to say how incremental that is um, compared to you know access to to waterborne crude and you know, how incremental that is compared to the, the broader uh, transportation fuel outlook. Right. And I think there's also a, a dimension, well, here, here in the United States, of course, we, we tend to view everything through our own lens, but I think a big part of the question is um, in, the, in the context of the Keystone XL and about Canadian crude exports to the United States is if the intention of the policy is to shut off of, you know, to keep the Canadian production in the ground, um, Will it or will Canadian producers find that they can uh, develop other pathways to access global markets and to compete therein? Um, yeah. And we saw a preview of this a few years ago when uh, pipeline capacity was insufficient compared to the production that was coming out and trying to be marketed. Uh, it was the golden age of rail, right? And so all of these rail uh, routes developed as, as another export route. The other, of course, um, uh, kind of accommodation that can be made when there's a logistical bottleneck like that is curtailments. And we've seen that in Canada as well. So um, I'm, it's hard to believe that something, a substitute like rail could uh, capture the same economics as, uh, as you know, the big capital plans of a, of a major pipeline like Keystone XL. So I think incrementally there can be some substitute pathways um, I, it's probably unlikely that it will keep all of the hydrocarbons in the ground and prevent any of the associated uh, emissions from, from taking place. So there probably is both a political and policy dimension to this decision. As a, in, Believe in, it or not. <laughs> imagine that. Um, um, here, um, one, uh, Julio Arboleda has asked, uh, you know, in the short term, the uh, panelists' pers you know, perspectives on uh, tidal oil production this year uh, and, and going forward and what price level is needed for it to be competitive. So in terms of uh, the landscape for tight oil producers, um, many are, are guiding for a WTI price um, or guiding their, their maintenance mode. So production being basically flat at WTI prices between you know, 48 and 52, so broadly that $50 range. So um, I, I do think that there's a, an unknown element of what private producers, smaller producers will do um, at a, a level that goes from WTI of 55 up to the $60 range. Um, there's also an open question about what some majors would do if that uh, price signal would be uh, is, is the one um, that, that, that we are facing. Um, but I think it's very clear that the publicly reporting small and medium sized as well as large cap ENPs are not in a world right now where they're going to be massively increasing CapEx as they may have in the past. Um, and that reinvestment rate, um, 
you know, in, in terms of translating incremental revenue into uh, spend um, is now far below the 100% line in, and instead in that sort of 65 to, to 80% range. Um, and that's going to lead to uh, a much flatter production profile in the near term. And in our view, only uh, about a, you know, 150 to 250,000 barrel a day growth um, on average out to 2030 um, in, in that world. Clay, I don't know if you agree. Yeah, I, th I think that makes sense directionally. I think that um, certainly we're not, we're not um, rebounding from 11 to 13. Uh, that's not in the cards. There can be some incremental increases, as Michael mentioned. I think there are a lot of drilled and uncompleted wells that at the right price point, probably upper 50s towards 60, uh, could be uh, brought into production. There could be some producer hedging at those levels that um, incentivize a little bit. But as as we know, and as we've all been through before in this in the patch, um, the access to capital is not going to be like it was before. And so that's going to be the number one um, probably determinant, in addition to obviously the flat price um, profile. The other thing too that is really interesting for me to think about relates to that export capacity. And again, the, the net export position is there are quite a few of those export um, uh, dock and, and terminal expansion projects that are already um, have made their final investment decision. Some of them are already under construction. And so the question is, can there be enough pull from those international markets for US crude, light crude, to uh, incentivize uh, at, the right, at the right price point, um, you know, increased United States production from tight oil? And, uh, and there again, we'll have to also look at the overall um, competition with OPEC plus and their decisions. And uh, just to bring it back to the beginning of the conversation, Mark, in your introductory remarks, you mentioned that um, uh, one of the reasons why we had the blip and the regression back to net importer for a few months was the fall off in domestic production in the United States. Definitely true. But also remember that was during the, uh, the, the short lived uh, price war and market share war in OPEC plus when the United States and the Gulf Coast in particular got hit with this surge of, of unexpected Saudi crude that was kind of flooded into the area. I think it was a million barrels per day for a month or two. So uh, the United States is gonna be influenced um, in terms of its production decisions at the individual company level by what's going on naturally with the other competitors for crude around the world. So we also have to keep an eye on OPEC plus and, and how they do during the overall economic recovery in the first half of the year. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so we started out talking about U.S. Uh, you know, uh, you know, becoming a net oil exporter. We've kind of covered the globe. We wound up talking about domestic consumption uh, prospects. Uh, we talked about uh, shale. We talked about uh, Chinese refiners. We talked about Canadian oil production. And I think that's actually the point. You know, this is a massively complex intricately interconnected system, you know, and understanding the particular dimensions of how U.S. crude and refined products play into that, um, you know, I think is a, an important part of understanding the global market as well as uh, U.S. economic and policymaking. Uh, and I'd like to thank Clay and Michael, uh, as well as Doug and the U.S. AEE team for hosting us today for what I hope you all have found to be a useful and enlightening addition to the conversation on these topics. Uh, thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to join us for this event. Uh, and we will look forward to staying in touch with you going forward. Hope you all have a nice day. Thank you.